Welcome back. It has been a while <laughs> since I've gotten an update on the Tripacer. So we're going to do that today. So the first thing that I want to point out is that I haven't exactly been devoting time to the Tripacer. Had to take a little break. Uh, reason being, I had some work to do. And when I do some of this work that I do, it leaves me with very little time to work on a dedicated project. So I've been focusing on some smaller things here and there, uh, some prop testing, which I will be making a video on a little bit later in the Tripacer seri series. Uh, it's pretty interesting data that I think will help people get a little more informed in terms of their prop selection. It's really kind of cool, uh, so stay tuned for that. And I was out at the field flying my Great Plains Escapade. Now the Escapade is a great sport flyer. Uh, and I, when I re had received it, it had a glow engine in it. Those who know me, I don't fly liquid fuel. And I, I just wasn't happy with any of the motor or prop combinations that I put in it. And I was only doing it on four cells and yeah, I could have gone to five, but then I would have had to buy a new battery. I was just trying to make it work, uh, for almost a year. Jeez. Uh, just trying to fly it on four cells and I just was not happy with how it was performing. So I, I send, <laughs> I send and I converted it back to a glow engine. Uh, this took me all of an hour to do, but it was a good fun learning experience to do at the field with some of my club members. Uh, teaching me and me learning how to tune a glow engine. It's been a long time, shall we say, since I've had to do something like that. Uh, thankfully, another wonderful gentleman in the club had uh, donated a whole bunch of parts and materials, including a field box uh, with a starter. And so I picked up a glow igniter and some fuel and a pump. And so now I'm flying one plane on glow. So that's what I've been up to. Let's get into some specifics on the Tripacer. So the Tripacer pretty much looks exactly the same on the front end. Uh, maybe a little bit extra dust. What I do want to point out is that the tail has been completely stripped down and disassembled. And what I think I am going to do is back here, uh, get a better perspective here. There's too much going on for two dimensions on your screen. So this push rod sleeve with this push rod uh, comes out at an angle and what they had tried to do was put a piece of balsa on the outside of these two stringers and in fact all the way up to this one these stringers are what supports the horizontal stabilizer okay so what they had done is essentially try to put sheeting over top of all this but it didn't really work it was very not good so I am going to create a flat piece of balsa that is inserted between these two and I will do a hole and make this much more flush and fit and finish will be fantastic. And I'll do the same thing on the other side. Um, it's, it's really just identical on the other side. Just the exit hole is, uh, exit hole is a little bit different uh, as you can see from the top view. So not a huge deal, but that's what's going on back here. Uh, I have been able to clean up a lot of these. I need to do another check, uh, see if anything has come loose. And um, moving on, I will not <laughs> try to use epoxy all over the tail. Um, that said, I've gotten a whole bunch of stuff looked over up here on these sides. These sides look good for the most part. Uh, just need a couple of touch up things here and there that I need to blend. Uh, again, not a huge deal. We'll come back to this. Over here, <laughs> uh, so I 
got a new soldering station. That's another thing that happened. My birthday. Uh, that was my birthday gift for my wife. Thank you, sweetie. And I also got the tailplanes stripped down and recovered in Oratex. Some of them I chose not to have the hinges removed. Just be well, the rudder, let's, okay. So the rudder looked like someone had taken splinters and threw the splinters into a wood chipper and then pieced them back together. So a lot, there was a lot of here and there work on the rudder specifically. Everything else was pretty straightforward. Uh, these two cross members in the V-stab, those uh, came loose back here. So I re-glued those. There were several things loose in here in the H-stab. Again, CA took care of that. There were a couple of bigger gaps in the elevator uh, that I used uh, Gorilla Glue for. So not a huge deal on the tail planes. Uh, I, I will, wow, okay. So I made a space here and I will re-epoxy that on and I will likely peel away more of the covering here and round this out. I was able to meet up at Patrick's plane and have a look at it because I needed to see some specific details. I wanted to see how the transition was on the empennage and also how things work here. Oh, this is a complicated airplane. Okay, so if you're looking at the model, it's kind of weird looking at straight on. Um, what's weird about the full scale is that the passenger entry for the rear seat, there's a door here, right? Well, the door sticks out like a bit more it's very strange it sticks out more than the opposite side it's very odd the other thing that we noticed is that on the full scale airplane so starting here it's pretty much flat and then from the from the top view the top view it actually dips in and then comes out but for the most part it is flat so <sighs> Going back to what I was going to do with this and strip all of this off, I'm still going to do that because it's the simplest thing to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to strip all of this uh, balsa skin off and I'm going to add wood here and I'm going to put the cowl back on and try to line up the skin to that. So. I'm going to put you guys on a time lapse and see what's what as I strip this down and before I get too carried away and remount the cowl, which is kind of a hassle, I'm going to do a full inspection here and show you guys exactly what I find. So as we have all of the sheeting removed, we find a couple of things. Um, first of all, this is not a complete stringer. <laughs> it is segmented, so I it's loose here. So it's easy enough to just cut it out and put in a proper piece of wood. Uh, that way we can shore up the uh, instrument panel there. Also, a thing that I noticed is that there's a cross brace here, but not here. Okay, so we're gonna make that symmetrical. Uh, I'd rather add some rigidity than take it away. So we'll add one of these on the other side. So looking at the wood again, this is uh, maybe a little bit of fuel staining here, but I'm not really too worried about it. Uh, there is nothing on the other side, absolutely nothing. Dry as a bone, looks great and uh, cut away. So there were these balsa chunks here that were part of the old cowl mounting that's, that that uh, was screwed into it. Why you would use soft balsa? I don't know. Uh, there were formers here that were for the sheeting to butt up against this firewall piece here. Um, so I removed those as well. Not needed. 
essentially what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mount the cowl and then on the sides I will make some balsa okay so just just balsa and they're just going to be plates and they'll stick out right to be flush with the back side of the cowl and from there I will trace the cowl similar to how I did this uh, I will trace the cowl and then I will uh, sand those blocks down so that I can sheet over top of them. Essentially, I'll be bypassing this former altogether. And what I will do is I will create a lip here using some square stock. And that way I will have a lip for the balsa to uh, butt up against this sheet for and that way we can sheet this whole thing. Now up here there is going to be a gap here so that's why I'm only going to extend that that balsa piece up. Up here is going to be a little bit more tricky. What I'm probably going to do is uh, tape a piece of 164 ply or maybe tack a piece of 164 ply to the inside of the cowl and that way it will follow the transition between the cowl and over here. That way when I remove the cowl, the wood will stay in place and then I will cut the hatch into just the cowl. And the additional balsa that was here, again, I removed that. Gives me another, what, half inch? Another half inch of space for me to shove batteries in. And again, I can put the batteries sideways. I can put them long ways. I can move them all the way back. This is a huge, huge space. I have big hands. Uh, ruler, real quick. So it is, okay, for you Americans, six inches wide. The proper way is <clears throat> uh, 15, about 15 and a half, 15 centimeters, about 15 centimeters. And then deep, I, going all the way back there, I've, yeah, I've got like 20, 26 centimeters of space. Huge, huge space for batteries here. It's uh, uh, amazing. The trade-off is that I will not have space for doing like rudder pedals or anything because of this, this box. I don't want to take any of this away and lose the strength that's there. All right. So I know this is kind of long winded and not a whole lot of progress shown, but at least we have a plan of attack. We know what direction that we're going and it's a good one. All right. So we're removing a lot of this excess stuff and removing stuff that we know is possibly questionable. We did an inspection. We know that the fuel did not soak too much through to where we're going and it's not going to cause our, cause a rot problem or a weak spot. So uh, we're doing we're doing great. We're gonna move along now. Uh, we're gonna get some sheeting done. We're gonna get uh, we're gonna get things taken care of on this fuselage. Gonna have to do some painting because all of this yellow has got to go. And inside Patrick's plane is all blue. So I've got to get some paint somehow. Anyway, another problem for another day. Uh, keep on going and persevering to make your flying works of art.